of you who are joining us, my name is Jeremy Fioravanti. I'm the president of uh, the Delaware County Institute of Science. I'm a biology professor at Hack Harrisburg Area Community College. I'd like to welcome you to a portion of our 21-22 winter lecture series. It's all virtual this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this move has been no small feat. Our institution was founded in 1833, and our new quote unquote building was built in 1867. We are all volunteer, and we count on the charity and participation of volunteers to uh, keep our place going and vibrant. So I encourage you all to get involved, either through joining as members or uh, contributing uh, time or energy effort to our mission statement, which is to diffuse knowledge. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Gurton from Penn State, who is currently out of the state right now, uh, participating in a research endeavor and Dr. Dan King from Drexel for uh, hosting and managing the technical aspects of these lectures. Um, looks like uh, next month we'll have Dr. Melanie Frazier on Mar March 14th, I believe, um, to continue our virtual lecture series. But without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. King uh, so he can introduce our speaker this evening. Thank you, Jeremiah. Um, so our speaker tonight um, Russell Lusco has been a scientist for over 45 years. I'm 35 of that spent um, studying soil science and geology. He's a certified professional soil scientist and a licensed professional geologist with a bachelor's degree in anthropology and archaeology from Indiana University of Pennsylvania and a master's degree in geosciences from Westchester University. He's the co-owner of Lanchester Soil Consultants Incorporated and an adjunct professor of earth science at both Westchester University and Delaware County Community College. His soil consulting work and research has stretched from Alaska to Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, and Peru. He's an author of a number of peer-reviewed papers and is the lead author of The Traveler's Guide to the Geology of Costa Rica, the PAPSS Manual for Soil Investigation in Pennsylvania, and a co-author of a chapter in the book, Soils and Human Health. So we really look forward to uh, your talk tonight, Russ. I'm going to turn it over and um, look forward to your uh, presentation about your work in Costa Rica. All right, thank you, Dan. Uh, let me go ahead and start a screen share here. Okay, I uh, want to thank everybody for coming tonight and thank uh, you all for inviting me. Uh, what I want to talk about today is to, to take you on a little bit of a journey around Costa Rica and explore uh, some of the geology there and some of the physical features. It's hard to boil five years of, of writing and work uh, down into an hour, but I'm going to do my best here. Uh, as Dan said, I've been a scientist for uh, 45 years or so here. This is a photograph of me when I started out uh, doing research on an island in the Caribbean. I like to uh, put that out there just to, to, to prove my street cred as to how long I've been a scientist and also to point out that uh, I once had hair. I did not start out this way. But uh, tonight, let's talk about Costa Rica. Costa Rica uh, is a small country, just a little bit uh, larger than West Virginia, with a population of about 5.2 million. The uh, Costa Rican people refer to themselves as Ticos. Costa Rica is an area that relies heavily on, on agriculture, but only has about 4.4% of its land being arable. The large portions of the nation uh, are not suitable for agriculture. In this map you're seeing here, you see a lot of green. A lot of this area is inaccessible. There are no roads going to it. In fact, a lot of uh, this area here is actually uh, under indigenous uh, control. The indigenous tribes still uh, uh, control that. These are, this is a mountain, largely a mountainous country, though as we'll see, there are some broad flat plains in the north and along the coast. Costa Rica made a, a couple of interesting uh, political decisions in the 20th century. 
For example, they abolished their military in 1946 when they realized that they really didn't get anything out of it. They don't have a tremendous amount of mineral resources, so they're not in a lot of danger of being invaded by either Panama to the south or Nicaragua to the north. So they are the only nation in this hemisphere with no military. And their national uh, motto is Pura Vida, which means pure life. Another conscious decision they made in the uh, late 1960s and early 1970s was to stop uh, stripping their forests. They were essentially mining their forests for the uh, timber wealth there, but were convinced that if they left the forests in place and in the areas where they had cut it, let it grow back, that they could entice tourists to the country. And tourism is a large part of their gross domestic product now. The, for such a small country, it has a, a tremendous amount of variety. There are 14 different climatic zones and six different types of rainforest. A lot of people go to Costa Rica to visit it because of its biodiversity. Thousands of species of vascular plants, millions of species of insect, hundreds of species of mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and freshwater fish that have been cataloged so far. We're still discovering new species uh, in Costa Rica. So a lot of people go there looking for this biodiversity, uh, especially uh, it, is, it is a bird watching Mecca. So typically you go there and you're going to see animals such as this, the white-faced coati, uh, sloths, both three-toed and two-toed sloths. And if you ever visit the country, I will tell you, uh, if you're with a group and somebody shouts from ahead, you know, hey, quick, come see, there's a sloth. You don't have to rush. You don't have to run. Sloths live up to their name. You can walk very leisurely to them and get some very good photos of them. Uh, this guy here, uh, or girl, I couldn't really tell. I was within inches of its face taking taking photographs. They are they they are excellent photograph uh, photography subjects. As I said, uh, brilliant bird life. The scarlet macaws are absolutely spectacular. But not to slight smaller species of birds, such as this hummingbird. Uh, these cuddly creatures are found there. These are crocodiles. Uh, mostly on the Pacific side, but we have seen them on the Atlantic side uh, as well. And their cousins, the Caymans. Now, interestingly, when I worked in Puerto Rico a few years ago, they, they cautioned us to stay away from the water because there were Caymans. In Costa Rica, I was told, if there are Caymans, it's safe to dive into the water because Caymans and crocodiles don't live together. Uh, hopefully, they, uh, the, the crocodiles know that rule. Uh, as I said, tremendous variability of reptiles and amphibians. This is a poison dart frog. These are found wild in the lowlands of uh, Costa Rica. As you can see, the person handling this one is wearing gloves for a good reason. Now, this is not a particularly virulent uh, variety of poison dart frog, but handling it with your bare hands, probably not a good idea. Insects, lots of insects. Uh, we were down there in 2016. This is a graduate student, Matt Cole. Uh, we all came back from getting dinner, getting ready to turn in for the evening. And uh, this creature was hanging out in front of my door. So I shouted to the students, Matt and another student came down and Matt immediately scooped it up, put it on his hand so I could get a good picture. As I was taking the photograph, he asked, do these things bite? And I said, I have not a clue, but I think we're gonna find out pretty soon. As it turns out, they do not. They are actually pretty docile creatures. Large spiders, really big spiders. Uh, yeah, we're really gonna miss Gina. That spider did a number on her. Actually, the spider though, it was about three inches, or uh, I'm sorry, about six inches in diameter. Uh, Gina was in no danger here. A uh, group of us were, were uh, on the beach I was trying to take a picture of this spider on its web and couldn't really get it and Gina walked across. And I said, wait, wait, back up. I need the contrast. 
and uh, got the photograph. Butterflies, this is probably the most famous of them, the Morpheo species, and the photograph does not do it justice. In sunlight, these things are absolutely iridescent. Iguanas, other reptiles, monkeys, there are four species of monkeys there. These are the white-faced capuchins. If you ever find yourself there and these guys are around, you want to keep a firm hand on your backpack because they have learned that that's where you keep lunch and they will steal it given half a chance. I Before I did soils and geology research, I did research with monkeys. And even though I was the most experienced with them on one of the trips down there where we had a group of students, uh, I had a run in with monkeys, did not draw blood, but uh, a monkey running across above you will sometimes drop things that you would not want on your body that turned into a very smelly day uh, when I got uh, inadvertently bombed by that howler monkey. And I mentioned the reptiles. There are 23 known species of venomous snakes in Costa Rica, but only three of them are considered dangerous to humans. I apologize for the blurry picture here, but uh, at the one research center that we, uh, we were visiting, this was hung on the wall in the bathroom. And I took that uh, with, my, with my cell phone. Uh, the one to really watch out for is this lower one here, the Fertilance. They are actually aggressive. If they see you, they will come after you. And they can spit their venom, and they do. They try to get it in your eyes. Uh, they really want to hurt you, so you really do not want to encounter them. So enough about the wildlife. What makes Costa Rica so special? Well, it is the newest part of this continental pair of North and South America prior to the formation of the Isthmus of Panama, which includes Costa Rica. There was free transfer of water and animals, uh, sea creatures between the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. North and South America were connected when the supercontinent of Pangaea was together. When that started breaking up about 201 million years ago, North and South America separated and did not reconnect until about 5 million years ago. So among the biological diversity you will find in Costa Rica, you find both South American and North American animals. That white-faced coati that I showed you essentially inhabits the same niche as raccoons do here in North America. So. In Costa Rica, your trash can can get raided by both white-faced coatis and raccoons on the same evening. If we look back in time, 23 million years ago, North and South America were not connected, but this tectonic plate, the Cocos Plate, was moving north eastward. The Caribbean Plate up here moving roughly south uh, westward. The two colliding, the Cocos Plate, subducting underneath of the Caribbean plate. Over time, we see islands, seamounts coming off of the Galapagos hotspot here being accreted onto an island arc that formed here at the collision zone. By about 14.7 million years ago, these islands are growing and by about 5 million years ago, we get complete closure of the Isthmus of, of Panama, shutting off the, the water flow between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. There are some who say that this closing off of ocean currents may have contributed to the onset of the Pleistocene glaciations. So we are looking at the collision between an oceanic plate here, the Caribbean plate, and an oceanic plate here, the Cocos plate. The Caribbean plate is slightly lighter, so it overrides the Cocos plate. The Cocos plate subducts underneath of it. This is what is known as a convergent boundary. Now, in this figure, it shows this being continental crust. In our case, these are two heavy basaltic oceanic plates. Just one tends to be a little bit heavier than the other, the Cocos plate, which is uh, subducting underneath. As it does that, it imparts a great deal of friction. It also carries wet sediments down, and this may seem counterintuitive, but water lowers the melting point of rocks. 
So the heat from this friction melts uh, solid rock in the Earth's crust. So we're not talking about mantle material being brought to the surface. This is crustal rock that is being melted, rising to the surface and forming volcanoes. So if we look at this Google Earth image of Costa Rica, we can actually see the bathymetry here off the coast where our subduction trend, trench is, uh, is, is occurring. So this is the Cocos Plate slamming into and subducting underneath of the Caribbean Plate here. And you can see these little underwater seamounts that were part of the Galapagos Archipelago. And each time one of those subducts in this region here, it forces that air, that land up. Uh, as a result, we have a, a high cordillera here, a high mountain range uh, here that is not necessarily volcanic in origin. And then our volcanoes clustered here to the north. So this is part of the Central American volcanic arc belt. And we see the important volcanoes here in Costa Rica, uh, Erosi, Rincón de la uh, Vieja, Miravales, Arenal, uh, Barva, Torialba, Irazú. We'll talk a little bit more about those in a moment. And here, just over the border in uh, Panama, is Baru, which has impacted Costa Rica in the past in its eruptions. This is possibly the most famous of the uh, Costa Rican volcanoes. This is Mount Arenal. It's the same volcano that is in my virtual backdrop behind me. Your classic Hollywood uh, movie shaped volcano, conic in shape. This is a stratovolcano, an andesitic stratovolcano, which means that the magma coming out of here is relatively high in silica. Now, one thing I tell my introduction uh, to earth science students. Simple way to do risk analysis on a volcano. You're in a strange place, there's a mountain making noise. The first thing you wanna do is look at the rocks on the ground. The lighter the color of the rocks, the higher the silica content, and the less, the, or the more viscous that magma is going to be, the less chance that it wants to flow up out of that magma tube and out the crater at the top go towards the darker end. Those are what are no, known as the mafic uh, magmas, higher in iron and magnesium. When those melt, they flow readily. So if you look at pictures of volcanoes in Hawaii where the lava just flows away and tourists can stand right next to the lava flow safely, those are the mafic volcanoes. Obsidian, volcanic glass, defies this rule in that volcanic glass is usually black. So you want to ignore any volcanic glass that you see and look at the other rocks. Now, these rocks I picked up off of the ground, uh, not at Arenal, but at a related volcano, Torrealba, and was able to quickly tell the students with me, you know, now here's our risk analysis. We have a white rock and we have obsidian. If that volcano is making noise, we want to get away as quickly as possible because this is a volcano that can erupt violently and they tend to, when they erupt, they do tend to erupt explosively. Uh, I have a particular fondness for Mount Arenal because it wasn't the first volcano I ever saw, but it is the volcano that turned me into a geologist. I've been a soil scientist for many years, uh, visited Costa Rica, about uh, 15, 16 years ago, 17 years ago uh, with my family and Mount Arenal was erupting. And I was so enthralled by that, that when we got back, I enrolled in a graduate degree and got my master's degree in geology. So if we look at a, a relief map of the country, we will see that to the north, we have a string of volcanoes, which we will return to. This is known as the Orosi Cacao Complex. This is the volcanoes Tenorio, Miravales, Rincon de la Vieja, and Orosi and Cacao. There is a depression between them, occupied by a lake, which is partially man-made, the, the lake being partially man-made. To the south of that is the Las Perdidos uh, Complex, 
which is Cerro Chato and Arenal. To the uh, east here, we have the central range, uh, four main volcanoes, Poas, Barva, Irazu, and Torrealba. And these overshadow something known as the Central Valley. Uh, more about that in a second. And then to the south, we have the Talamanca Cordillera, which is high mountains, no active uh, volcanoes there. So if we look at a map of the country, uh, we can see that here are our volcanoes. We have a broad flat plain here to the north, which grades north towards uh, Lake Nicaragua, famous for having the, own, the world's only freshwater sharks uh, in the world. Our volcanic range, we have the Santa Elena Peninsula here, the Nicoya Peninsula here, and uh, the Osa Peninsula down here. Now, there's an old saying that there are two types of people in the world. There are people who uh, divide things into two groups, and there are people who don't divide things into two groups. There's a natural tendency to want to divide the country up into geographic regions. We have done that. And when I say we, uh, I'm, I'm referring to uh, my co-authors, uh, Dr. Adolfo Quesada Roman from the University of Costa Rica and Dr. Daria Nicotina from Westchester University. Uh, we've all worked together on, uh, uh, on a book on the geology of Costa Rica. And we broke it into geographic regions. I hesitate to do that, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm going to do a very poor job of it. But uh, so we have this Northern Caribbean region, which is that broad flat plain, Southern Caribbean region, much smaller, uh, but again, flat, but grading upwards into the Cordillera here. The Central Valley, where the, the nation's capital and the vast majority of the population lives the Northern Pacific region, which includes uh, this Los Perdidos uh, volcanic range and the, the Santa Elena and Nicoya peninsulas, a Central Pacific, which is very narrow. It is a narrow Piedmont sandwich between the mountains here and the ocean, and then a Southern Pacific region, which includes the Osa Peninsula. And we're going to take a little bit of a journey. I'm gonna start us briefly in the Central Valley, and then we're gonna move up into this coastal plain, briefly explore the, the Caribbean, and then do a counterclockwise rotation around the country. So most people's first experience with Costa Rica is one they landing at uh, Juan Santa Maria uh, Airport outside of San Jose. I've been to Costa Rica a number of times. I've done the resort route. I've done uh, hostels. I, I've rented places from local individuals. And I really urge uh, people to go with the smaller venues because then you get to know the people. The people of Costa Rica are extremely friendly. Uh, this particular photograph is taken from the roof of a little hotel in San Jose called Hotel Cactus. It's very reasonably priced. Uh, walking distance to, to restaurants, and a nice way to start off your journey. We had a group of students when this uh, picture was taken. Uh, Daria Nicotina had invited me to help her uh, with a study abroad course. So this is our first morning. Uh, we, we're, we're waking up, we go up on the roof to have breakfast, and here is our view. And what's the first thing we see? This is the volcano Barva overlooking the capital city. So as you see the capital city here, San Jose uh, and the neighboring town of Cartago are in the shadow of these four volcanoes and the airport periodically gets shut down when these volcanoes erupt. Turrialba uh, has been erupting recently. Poaz, beautiful place. Uh, there is actually a park on the top of Poaz, you can drive up into the crater of Poaz, look down into the crater. I, unfortunately, every time I have been there, Poaz has been, has been erupting and I haven't been able to get there. But we are going to travel northward. There's a nice route between Poaz and Barva that will get us through the mountains. We do have to go up, uh, but it'll take us into this northern uh, coastal plain. So here we are traveling across 
uh, this mountain pass and we get stopped in traffic because there is work being done on the road. The work that is being done on the road is cutting these terraces uh, into the banks on either side because this road periodically gets closed because of landslides. So they, the crew literally starts at the southern end of this highway, works their way to the northern end, cutting these terraces. When they get to the northern end, they turn around, come back and start all over again. It is a constant uh, fight to maintain these, these slopes. The reason for that is these slopes are composed of oxisols. And this is uh, my friend and co-author Adolfo uh, Quesada Roman. Uh, these oxisols have a very high clay content. I haven't measured the clay content in the Costa Rican oxisols, but when we did work in Puerto Rico and we were working in these oxisols, they were 100% clay. It's the first time I ever worked in a soil that was 100% clay. As a result, they have, uh, I, I want to say a low frictional coefficient, but I probably have that wrong. It's probably uh, goes the other direction. But suffice it to say, if you picked up a handful of this material right here and rubbed it between your thumb and forefinger, it feels greasy. So this area, tectonically active, prone to earthquakes, has a soil that's very slippery, uh, and we're in the tropics between a third and a half of the rainfall in the world is in the tropics. So you're setting up a recipe for landslides. Even with this maintenance that they're doing, here we see slope failures. So here's one of those terraces that they cut and it still collapsed. So obviously a process that must continue in order to keep these roads viable. We do see mass movement uh, in, in a number of places, these cracks that you see in the soil uh, are literally the land opening up and this material sliding. This material wants to slide out and close this road here. This is not an uncommon site there. To the south of where our picture was taken, where Adolfo was standing, there was a town called Chinchona. In 2009, an earthquake caused a landslide that caused the town of Chinchona to slide down the mountainside into the valley, killing 34 people, another 64 are missing, over 90 injured. It took days to pull the survivors out of there by helicopter. It was the only way to access them. The town no longer exists. Everybody was resettled in another nearby town. And here you see those terraces along this highway there to slow this mass movement. If you continue along this highway, you will come to this, the La Paz waterfall, beautiful waterfall. Waterfalls are very common in Costa Rica because of the extreme tectonic activity there. If you take a little bit of a detour, you can get to Laguna de Hul. This is an extinct gas mar that is a volcano where groundwater infiltrated, came in contact with the magma and caused what is known as a phreatic eruption. There's a steam eruption that devastated the volcano. The caldera collapsed in upon itself. It is now an extinct volcano and a nice place, uh, beautiful view. It was a little bit foggy the day that we were there, but you can go uh, uh, canoeing, kayaking, swimming here. After we cross the mountain range and we enter into this northern plain, we are starting to escape the volcanoes, but not completely. We get these little cinder cones occurring there. These are different from the stratovolcanoes, not as violent, uh, generally loose material. Uh, if there is lava that comes out, it tends to leak out the bottom and not come out the top. But there's a series of these uh, in the northern uh, coastal plain. And I realize this is a, a busy geologic map here. The red is that volcanic range. We've just crossed over it to get into this broad <coughs> coastal plain, the Lanora de San Carlos and the Lanora de Tortuguero. These cinder cones are located right in this area here. And then the volcanism stops as you head to the northeast. And it's thought we have these series of thrust faults here. And it's believed that those thrust faults 
are stopping the magma from migrating to the north and keeping it isolated in these volcanic complexes here. Now we're going to turn to the east and head out towards the coast, you get to the Caribbean coast. We're now in low-lying, humid areas. Uh, on the one hand, you have the beautiful beaches. On the other hand, this is where those snakes that we talked about uh, previously exist. Uh, someone had asked a question before we started about the difficulty of doing field work. You know, every site presents its own uh, uh, challenges, some of which you'll see momentarily, but I picked up the habit of before I would step off of a trail, I would scoop up a handful of gravel and throw it ahead of me, hoping to warn the snakes uh, so that they would go away. And maybe there were no snakes, but uh, I didn't encounter any, so I'm going to think that my tactic worked. Also on the Caribbean coast, now this is Isla Coribe, which uh, is where Christopher Columbus stopped on one of his voyages to take on drinking water. And first, he was the first uh, European, or he and his crew were the first Europeans to set their eyes on Costa Rica. And he saw some of the natives wearing some gold ornamentation. He named it Costa Rica, which is a bad name uh, for what he was thinking of, because Costa Rica does not have a lot of mineral wealth. So its name is a bit of a misnomer. Its real wealth is in its beauty and its very, very friendly people. And historically, the Costa Rican people have had to cooperate with each other because during the days of, Spanish, of the Spanish Empire, the Spaniards' uh, attitude was benign neglect. We we're not getting any gold or silver out of you. We're not going to help you. So the people there had to help themselves. And that continues to, to this day. This is why you, you find the, the, the natives of Costa Rica to be extremely friendly people. Uh, you know, if, if you get a flat tire, they're going to stop and help you. If you are lost, they're going to direct you. Something else I want to point out in this picture, you see these foundational pylons here. Uh, this area was struck by an earthquake in 1991, a 7.7 .7 Richter magnitude, and it uplifted large portions of the coast. You see here our group of students from Westchester University standing on uh, a coral reef that is now above the water. This had a devastating effect on the coral reefs. It killed off a lot of them, which can be seen as a tragedy. But if you look to the landward, towards the mountains, what you see is kind of a, a stepwise set of terraces. And if you examine those terraces, they are carbonate terraces. This is how they formed. This area periodically uplifts and then new coral reefs form, and then there will be another uplift in the future. And these will end up up on, on the, the flanks of the mountains at some point in the future. This is just the process of this area. Uh, to the south of here, is a, a very nice uh, uh, park uh, called Cahuita. Uh, we visited there with the students. These are, are my co-authors, uh, Daria Nicotina and, and Adolfo, who you had seen before. You know, for all the, the time that we spent together there and the work that we've put into it, I could not find one photograph of the three of us together, probably because one of us was always taking the photographs. But here they are examining a fossil uh, zilopal uh, here in Cahuita. If we turn now to the north and go back out into that broad, flat plain, you rapidly run out of roads and water becomes your method of transportation. So here's your taxi cab if you want to get around in the northern regions uh, of the Caribbean coast. There simply aren't any roads. And uh, here's here is your transportation. Now we're in a in an area of dense, dense rainforest, low lying. Uh, it's the sort of area that if a, if a velociraptor poked its head out, you wouldn't be surprised by that. It's that kind of area. On this particular trip, we were heading uh, to this uh, Canyo Palma, the Coterc Biological Research Center, to spend a few days with them. Uh, very nice uh, group of people, very nice facilities there. We were hoping to partner with them on research in the future. 
Uh, this is some of our accommodations there. Everything has to be built on stilts because in the rainy season, it's all under uh, underwater. And that is the bathroom. The bathroom has to be the highest for those, those toilets to actually drain. Now let's retrace our, our path and go back. So we crossed the mountains uh, about here and turned east. Let's come back and take a look at this region here. Uh, on our way, we pass another extinct gas mar, the Rio Cuarto mar. Uh, not well known to tourists, but a favorite place for locals to go. Uh, beautiful place off the beaten path. Uh, nice clear waters. Uh, people go to there to picnic, to swim, to fish. But let's take a look at this volcanic complex here. These red dots are hot springs areas. Uh, here is Tenorio Volcano, Miravales, uh, the Goyaba Caldera, which we will come back to, Rincon de la Vieja, which is a series of volcanoes, and the Orosi Cacao Complex. And I want you to take a look at this broad, flat area here. We'll come back to that, but that is all related to this huge caldera here at Goyabo. Rincon de la Vieja is active. It erupted just this last week. And what you are seeing, these gas clouds coming through here are pyroclastic flows. So this is a pyroclastic eruption. These are very dangerous. You don't want to get caught in one of those. So this area is active uh, and, and has been very active in the past. Tenorio Volcano boasts an, a very interesting feature. This is Rio Celeste. Beautiful waterfall there and this beautiful turquoise water. This is a hydrothermal river. So this water is hot. Uh, it might have been cooled by the waterfall, uh, but I would not recommend diving into here. Uh, this is the local mermaid that lives in Rio Celeste. Um, actually, that is Megan Helmke, uh, the daughter of Martin and Vicki Helmke, my friends uh, from Westchester. The four of us uh, traveled to, to Costa Rica to gather uh, some information in 2019 and 2020. If you... Uh, go from the waterfall upslope. This is on the volcano Tenorio, and you reach a point where two clear streams come together and form this beautiful turquoise water. As I said, these are hot uh, springs. You can see hot water bubbling up, uh, you know, uh, steam coming out of these, these rivers. And this color change has to do with flocculation of aluminosilicates in the water uh, to a size where they scatter the light uh, to produce the same color as the sky. Uh, here we are at Mount Arinal, which is just to the south of Tenorio and a fine looking group of students. Uh, there again, my friend and colleague, Daria Nicotina. Uh, this is in 2016. Now, when Arinal erupted. The Arenal volcano erupted in 1968 very violently. And up until that point, it wasn't known to be an active volcano. And it erupted steadily from 1968 until 2010. And when these volcanoes erupt, they tend to produce these pyroclastic flows. And now this is not Arinal, this is Mount Sinabung in Indonesia. This film is not sped up at all. This is real time. And this is the real danger with these. That cloud of ash and dust and lapilli coming out of there, superheated over a thousand degrees Fahrenheit, moving at a couple hundred miles per hour. If you're caught in the path of this, the prognosis for you is not very good. This is the aftermath of a pyroclastic flow on Mount Arinal. The pyroclastic flow was in 1992. I took this photograph in 2006. So it literally just incinerated a path through the rainforest and took two, two tourists and a guide with it. Uh, there were three fatalities from that particular pyroclastic flow. So this is the real danger with these volcanoes.
the you know in the hollywood movies everybody's worried about the lava lava flows are slow you can walk away from a lava flow the main danger from a lava flow to you is if you lay down in front of it and try to take a nap you may ask yourself why would anybody live near a volcano well the andesols, the volcanic soils formed from that volcanic ash, extremely fertile, extremely easy to work. So the last eruption of Arinal prior to 1968 was around 1500. 500 years, it's easy to forget that that thing is a volcano. When you're making a good living, uh, it's real easy to forget that that thing might erupt. And over generations, you can forget. When it erupted in 1968, a lot of the people that lived there didn't even know that they lived near a volcano. This is the lava flow from the 1992 eruption, the same one that produced that uh, uh, pyroclastic flow. Now, these rocks are dark. And remember I said the lighter the rocks, the more dangerous. These Andesite stratovolcanoes here in Costa Rica, like Arinal, have a tendency to start with an explosive eruption. So that's that high silica magma coming to the surface and then follow up with some lower silica material. But still, this is not like the Hawaiian volcanoes. This stuff does not flow out. Notice it's not smooth. These are jagged boulders. It literally extrudes out the top of the mountain and rolls down as these red hot boulders. Um, that is my daughter Kelly in there for scale to give you an idea of what the size of these boulders are. Now, fast forward a decade, and here's the same area. The rainforest is moving in. The rocks are starting to break down. They're also uh, collecting ash fall from the volcano. Uh, and this is allowing vegetation to move in. This is part of the natural progression. The rainforest will move back in, help to break these rocks down. And in various places in Costa Rica, you can see this. You can see open fields with the odd uh, jagged black boulder sticking up. That's a former lava flow that has now developed soil and is now possibly suitable for an agricultural field or a pasture. And I mentioned hot springs before, if you visit this area. Now, when, when Arinal erupted in 1968, it took the lives of 87 people and devastated, completely wiped out two villages. The one remaining village named La Fortuna is still there to this day. And the people of La Fortuna realized that uh, crazy people like me would pay money to come and see their volcano. And it is a huge tourist destination now. And one of the draws are these hot springs. There are a number of them there. You can pay to go in, soak in the hot springs, uh, you know, buy a, a drink or two, uh, get a meal. These places are very, very popular. Uh, to the north of here, in, in spots in this area, we do find some limestone uh, deposits. And uh, one of those, the Venado Cave System, here we are uh, taking that same group of students through the Venado Cave System. This is a, uh, a commercial uh, venture, a privately owned. Uh, so they will, they will come pick you up, take you there, lead you through the cave system, feed you afterwards, get you cleaned up and send you on your way. Here's a photograph of the stalactites uh, in the Venado Cave System. Interesting, when you go into caves, here or, or you know here in Pennsylvania in 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 North America they tend to be cold uh, we expected cold going into this it was actually warmer inside the cave than it was outside now let's return to this map and once again take a look at uh, the Goyaba caldera because you really can't see this caldera except from the air. It's 15 kilometers in diameter. It is huge. And we get an interesting effect occurring here. So we have this broad flat plain. We have warm, moist air coming in off the Caribbean, hitting these mountains, being forced up over the mountain, and we get a rain shadow effect. That is, the 
Clouds have to go up the mountainside, shed their water along the way. When they get to the top, now it's dry air and it drops down the other side and it helps dry out the land on the other side. So in a very short distance, you can go from rainforest to cloud forest to kind of a Mediterranean climate simply by going from here to here to there. When we get across into this dry climate, we find that that broad flat plain that I mentioned that is associated with the Guyaba caldera is all ignimbrite sheets. These are those the aftermath of large pyroclastic flows. So here, the, the deposits coming from pyroclastic flows are referred to as ignimbrites, or it literally means uh, fire fragments. And uh, so here we have this cemented ignimbrite, and then there's a gap. This is soil here. This is a paleosol. This is a buried soil sequence that was formed on top of ignimbrites. So we're talking a huge pyroclastic outpouring from this Guyaba caldera, then a quiet period long enough to form soil, and then another uh, outpouring of a tremendous amount of this pyroclastic material. This stuff is acidic. So the soils that form from it are acidic and we get very sparse xerophytic vegetation growing in these areas. Not very good for agriculture. Best you can do is maybe pasture a few cattle there. Now, if we go and take a close look at the top of the paleosol, here's the paleosol, this pale brown, this ancient soil that's now buried above it, this uh, light colored, remember what I said, the light colored rocks are the ones that try to kill you, uh, ignimbrite here. Now look at this dark line here at the boundary. That's all the organic matter. By organic matter, I mean if there was topsoil when this pyroclastic flow came, if there was forest, if there were animals, if there were people, that's all that's left of them. They were vaporized and distilled into this maybe one millimeter layer of dark material. So uh, a little bit sobering to think of the size of a pyroclastic flow coming from a 15 kilometer wide caldera. Here is Adolfo again pointing out some of these ignimbrite sheets with the soil uh, exposed on top. And he snapped a picture of this uh, bald guy standing at a high point, trying to get a picture of the Goyaba caldera and failing miserably. This is the best photograph I could get. The caldera is simply too big to see from the ground. You can see a couple of parasitic uh, volcanic cones here. Uh, and I believe that is uh, Miravalles, the, the slopes of Miravalles disappearing into the clouds there. But this caldera is important to the country because they literally mine the heat coming out of it. The second largest uh, geothermal power plant in the world is located here, the Miravalles Geothermal Power Plant. Produces about 163 megawatts, about 14% of the nation's electrical capacity. Costa Rica has uh, widely embraced renewable energy sources, Luckily, they have this geothermal, they have uh, hydroelectric, a lot of wind turbines. They typically will go 300, 350 days a year without burning any fossil fuels for, to produce their electricity. Okay, so uh, Goyaba is up here. If we travel to the south here, there's an interesting town called Monte Verde, which is worth visiting. Uh, interesting to note, it was founded by Quakers from the United States who were trying to escape uh, compulsory military service uh, in uh, World War II. And it is located just over the top of the Cordillera there. So it is in the rain shadow. But from Monte Verde, you can go just back up to the, uh, to the ridge line and over, and you're now in cloud forest. So in walking distance, you can go from this Mediterranean, dry Mediterranean climate to an area that is perpetually in the clouds 
wet all the time. Uh, you're going to need rain gear while you're there. You're going to get wet anyway. And so you run into this tr tremendous biodiversity uh, as, as a result of this. Drop just over the, the edge, just over the lip into Monte Verde. We're in this dry Mediterranean climate, but there is a steady mist that falls on this area that's just made it over the top of the mountain. So it's a strange feeling. You're walking around, it's warm out, it's sunny out, but there's this gentle mist falling on you. It doesn't make your clothes wet, it doesn't make your skin wet, but it's cooling you all the time. It's like someone following you around with a little spray bottle, spraying you with water. It's a very, very pleasant uh, place to visit drop just a little bit down the slope, and now you're in that rain shadow. You are on the Pacific coast. The Pacific coast, the Nicoya Peninsula, the Santa Elena Peninsula, uh, widely varied. When we were working on our book, uh, Adolfo insisted on taking me to every beach, uh, virtually every beach along the Pacific coast, because each one is very different. And he wanted us to document the difference between these beaches. So you see here a broad black sand beach. Here's a, uh, another one where we have some pillow, lava, uh, pillow basalts here. These are underwater lava flows uh, with some mixed white and black sand beaches. Another Playa Azul, a black sand beach. Uh, you do find on these beaches, if you're a rock collector like me, I know it's gonna shock you to find out that I collect rocks, but I do. Uh, these radiolarian chirts, these red uh, flint material nodules uh, that weather out, these are precipitated silica. Uh, some serpentine, some ophiolites, which are ocean bottom deposits that have been up thrust onto the land. Uh, that little uh, bear there for scale. Uh, my granddaughter was about three years old when I was down there. And every time I would visit her, she would give me one of her toys to, for, to keep with me. Uh, and then the next time I would see her, I would give her that one back and she would give me another one. So this little uh, bear toy followed me around Costa Rica uh, for two weeks on this trip. Uh, again, some, some lavas uh, or basalts on a beach, uh, coral uplifted onto a beach, and this last one, uh, my absolute favorite, uh, why, oops, uh, on Playa Negra. This is something I had read about but never seen. So it took me 60 years to find this. These are fossils in an igneous rock. So this would have been uh, underwater lava flows. So the lava is cooling quickly, overwhelming probably some type of coral reef and the shells are preserved in the lava flow. Very, very rare. Now, just because we're in a dry area doesn't mean it doesn't rain. Here we are in the town of Samara. We got heavy thunderstorms. Uh, flooded the town. I remember having to wade through uh, almost knee-deep water to go in search of dinner that evening and the next day as we went on our travels. Now, not every river in Costa Rica has a bridge across it. Sometimes you have to drive through the river and sometimes after a rain you run into this where you simply can't cross and you have to turn back. And I love the road signs here. I especially love this crocodile not swim sign which uh, told me that I didn't wanna be in that water. Heading our way down the Pacific coast, there are some exposures of volcanic rocks there. So we're, we're running short on time, so I'm gonna try and speed up a little bit here. As we continue south, we're now in the Southern Pacific. We've gone down the Central Pacific, which is this narrow strip, and you can see in this map just how narrow it is. Very, very narrow Piedmont. Starts out a little bit wider, but squeezes as we get down there. Largely, it, it gets so narrow, largely because remember those seamounts that I pointed out from the Galapagos. Those are subducting underneath of here, so we get rapid uplift. We also have a strong thrust fault right along here that is keeping the land, when that fault uh, 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 activates, it moves the land upward. But as you 
uh, come down to this region and reach the Rio Taraba, you suddenly hit a broad plain here. And this was an area that was very, very uh, 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 attractive to the Native Americans here. So it has a long history. And so we find uh, some of their uh, handiwork here. One of the famous things uh, about Costa Rica uh, archaeology are the giant stone spheres. Uh, Finca 6 at Palmar Sur is a, a United Nations, uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And where these, uh, these, these giant stone spheres, what's called Las Bolas, uh, are found in situ, they tend to be in lines. And they were put in lines. If you sight down those lines, you will find where the sun will rise when the rainy season starts. So these were markers. Uh, maybe they were, uh, they had other significance, but you know, knowing when the rainy season starts is really important in a region like this. The Osa Peninsula, uh, just to the south of here, almost entirely covered by the Corcovado National Park. Uh, worth visiting if you are there in a, in a half day or a day's hike in the Corcovado, you may see more biological diversity in that day than you may see in the rest of your life. Uh, it is controlled. You cannot go in on your own. You have to have a guide. You have to have a permit to go in there. And it's difficult to access. Uh, when we went there, we had to drive to the end of the paved road, then another 27 kilometers to the end of the dirt road, and then walk the last uh, two and a half to three kilometers uh, to get to our starting point, uh, which got us to this, the Rio Madrigal. If we turn from here inland, back towards the Talamanca Cordillera. Uh, we head uphill and we begin a series of switchbacks and we gain about uh, a thousand meters of elevation in a matter of a couple of miles. And we go from the hot uh, Pacific uh, side here rapidly to uh, a highland area and uh, my friend Adolfo's uh, home uh, the town of San Vito, uh, where we stayed a couple of nights with his family, wonderful, wonderful people. But it was interesting to go from the hot, sweaty lowlands in a matter of 20 minutes to an area where, uh, well, it was a little bit chilly at night. And now if we turn to the north and head up along the Cordillera, that will return us to the Central Valley. And if it looks like I'm glossing over a lot, I am because we simply don't have the time for it. But as we make our way up through these highlands, we can get some very unusual things. We've been dealing with tropical conditions all along. There are peat bogs in these highland areas. It is cold enough up there uh, to form peat bogs and to form spodosols, the type of soil I expect to find in upstate Pennsylvania or New York. Uh, when we stopped, uh, to observe this, we got out of the car. It was about 40 degrees outside and we're wearing shorts. So it was a really quick uh, stop to take a look at this. And it would be wrong to end without talking about Mount Chiripo, the highest point in Costa Rica. I have not climbed Chiripo, Adolfo has. Uh, but if you get up there, what do you find? U-shaped valleys, and Paternoster Lakes, these are glaciated. So during the last glacial maximum, during the Pleistocene glaciations, there were active glaciers uh, here in the Talamanca Cordillera. And uh, here's a, a quick selfie of Adolfo and myself after we examined the Spodosol there by the peat bog. We could end there, but I'd rather end uh, with the mermaid of Rio Celeste. Uh, and I would never put words in anybody's mouth, but I'm sure she's thinking uh, the national uh, uh, theme there of Pura Vida. Okay, so all of this presentation was the wind up. Uh, here's the pitch. 
Uh, so we published this book, The Traveler's Guide to the Geology of Costa Rica, last year, myself, Adolfo, and Daria. It is available on Amazon. Uh, if you are interested, if you want to get it for a few dollars cheaper than what you'll get it on Amazon, uh, you can contact me directly and I can get you a, a slightly better price on it. Uh, and if you have any questions on, on uh, Costa, the Costa Rican geology or the, the nation itself at any time, feel free to email me. That is my work email address. And I went over one minute. Sorry, Dan. That's okay. Uh, thank you, Russ, for that fascinating tour around Costa Rica. Um, we're certainly a little pressed on time, but we do have some questions that have come in. So <clears throat> let me uh, toss you a couple questions, see if we can get some quick answers uh, before we let people um, head out. Uh, so the first question, uh, what time frame are we talking um, about for the soil layer forming between the pyroclastic layers? That would be an excellent subject for a master's thesis. <laughs> uh, I would love to know that. We have very little information on this. Uh, that is something I would, you know, I, I could probably spend three or four lifetimes uh, studying some of the things that I have seen in Costa Rica. And that is something I would love to know. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. Um, next question. Are the volcanoes um, here similar to those found in California, Oregon, and Washington? Similar to the Cascade Range, uh, slightly smaller though. They are andesite stratovolcanoes, similar to, for example, Mount St. Helens, but not quite as large as Mount St. Helens. Um, so the next question, could you talk more about the spodosol? Um, what is the soil like and what makes it distinctive? Uh, I, 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 I hate to sound like I'm evading a question, but uh, as I said, it was 40 degrees and we were wearing shorts. Uh, so we didn't spend a lot of time there. Uh, again, uh, another thing I would love to go back and spend some time on. Uh, this, is, this is not widespread that we know of, but again, keep in mind that large areas of those highlands have not been explored uh, in any detail. So for all we know, those spodosols could be th throughout that area. Um, Stu, um, one more question, I think. Uh, so there's a question that came in um, during the registration, asked about uh, soil orders, um, how many exist in Costa Rica, um, and how similar is uh, Costa Rica to Puerto Rico? Okay, uh, now I've worked in both uh, Puerto Rico and Costa Rica, and I do see some similarities there. Now, the bedrock in Puerto Rico is predominantly carbonate. Uh, so we're going to see some difference there. Carbonates are, are uh, more rare in Costa Rica, though there are spots of them. Uh, but we do see the oxisols. Uh, so asking about soil orders, we have oxisols are widespread. Uh, andosols uh, also. Uh, and antisols and inceptisols. Uh, so with the spodosols, that gives us five soil orders that we know of. But again, there's large portions of the country that have not been, uh, uh, have, been have not been classified uh, completely in that. So uh, I'm going to say that I, I, I'm willing to hang my hat on five uh, soil orders there, but uh, uh, I can't go beyond that. Um, so one more question just uh, popped in. Sure. I think we'll do this one as kind of our last one. Um, so, so says a sort of a travel question, what time of year have you been to Costa Rica and when is the rainy season? Okay, uh, the rainy season, now it, it's, it's interesting. I, I got tripped up by this because they are, Costa Rica is in the Northern hemisphere, but they call the rainy season their winter. And the rainy season is in, our summer. So their cool period is our hot period. Uh, it, the, the rainy season, there are a couple of them. Uh, it, it tends to start uh, mid-summer and then wrap up uh, around December. So uh, I, I've been there in the summer. I've been there in the winter, I've, in uh, you know our winter. Uh, and it's you, you, if, if you're going to visit there, I would avoid hurricane season. 
because it does get hit occasionally by hurricanes. And even if it doesn't get hit by hurricanes, you're going to get more rain and more humidity in the eastern part because of that. But heading there in, uh, say, uh, Christmas time and on, you do tend to be in the dry season. But that being said, remember all those climatic zones. So you can go to one climatic zone and it'd be cloudy and raining all the time. Get in your car, drive for an hour and be in sunshine and clear skies. All right. Well, thank you again so much, Russ, for uh, sharing your knowledge um, and your experiences in Costa Rica. Um, I just posted to uh, the chat the uh, link to the DCIS lecture series. I encourage you to go ahead and register for uh, the next uh, talk in March. Um, and I will turn it over to Jeremia for some final thoughts. Yep. Just uh, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. I look forward to seeing you uh, next month. It was